Okay, so the metaverse. Have you heard about the metaverse? I presume you have. And so let's start there. Um, the metaverse is dead. So I have some bad news for you there. Um, and there it comes. So if you follow actually Business Insider last week, last month, uh, one of the journalists said, you know what, this thing is dead. And it would make it the biggest fad in tech, tech life if you just look at the span from 2021 to 2023. And if you think about it, it's very true. Mark Zuckerberg, October 2021, announcing we're going to launch the metaverse, right? Then you saw Gartner jumping on the bandwagon, actually projecting that a quarter of us would spend an hour by 2026 in the metaverse. Then McKinsey jumped on it and said, boy, this is a $5 trillion opportunity. And not to be outdone, Citigroup published a report said this is going to be a $13 trillion opportunity. Just to put it in perspective, the global economy is $100 trillion. So you can imagine there was big, big hopes in that regard. Now, fast forward 2023, in March, Mark Zuckerberg, yet again, uh, live on stage, said the single biggest investment Meta now is doing is into AI. You saw Disney, maybe. They, they ditched their plans with building the metaverse for them. And also, Walmart had big plans to build the universe of play in Roblox, which they actually abandoned just six months into it. So, you can say this thing is dead and was dead on arrival. Now, where am I here if we did actually believe quite differently? And the key word is actually, what about the industrial metaverse? So, the, if you think about the metaverse and what comes to your mind, usually two things come to mind. Either from a gaming industry, you're in fancy virtual worlds, you're running around with superpowers, and they can do th things in the virtual world that you cannot do in the real world. Or, and you're thinking about VR glasses that gets you into this immersive environment. Well, I have bad news for you. None of them are so relevant in the industrial metaverse. But I'll get to this in a second. So if you think about it, the latest research would suggest that the industrial metaverse actually is going to be not only the fastest growing, but it's also going to be the biggest opportunity that we have. It's going to outdo consumer and enterprise. And the question is why? The very simple answer is because the industrial metaverse is about solving real world problems at the speed of digital in a digital world. This is really what the metaverse is doing. Now you can argue, well, is that thing already there or is that just a pipe dream? And let me tell you, the building blocks of the industrial metaverse are digital twins. So digital twins, if you don't know what they are, they are the representation of something that exists in the real world and you replicate them actually in the virtual world. And you can do great things with them. You can simulate it. So you can really look at stress. You can look at thermodynamics. You can look at it from an aerospace perspective. You can look at it from an automotive perspective, from all the applications. And you can do things usually in the digital space that you cannot do in the real space. And we can do this for all kinds of physics. So all from, from uh, FEM analyses, CFD analyses, acoustics, thermodynamics, anything you would like to simulate, you can do this in the virtual world. Except that it behaves exactly the same way as it would do in the real world. Why is that important? Otherwise, you cannot simulate what would happen if I, for example, dropped my phone one meter and then still it would withstand it. And that you can do in the virtual world as well. So, Digital twins are the building block of that. And I'm going to give you six examples, which I think is going to show you where this whole thing is going to go, because it's not going to be switched on overnight, but it will evolve. And the most obvious one of a digital twin actually are products. So you can build a product, a digital twin of a product. So let me give you an example of Unlimited Tomorrow, a company that is the world market leader in building prosthesis. So if you don't know, there's more than 50 million people around the world that suffer from limb losses. If you have a mean of, uh, of the means of building and designing prosthesis that fit to you, so that the socket, so the interface, is really neatly working, then you have something really done good for humanity because trust me, these people are suffering big time. And you can see it in her face. 
that's exactly the face that you would like to see of how technology with purpose can make a difference in humans and their daily lives. So using digital trends, you really can reduce the cost also by 90% by doing the build up in the virtual world. Now, what you can do in product side, you also can do in production. So we at Siemens, for example, we produce a lot of things. And we said, you know what, why don't we drink our own champagne, let be the customer zero, and let's build our own factory, which we just did. Totally digital native. We built it digitally before it was actually built in the real world. The nice thing about this is it is 20% more productive and as you can imagine, 40% more flexible. Why? Because you can simulate. You can look at, you know, how is the outlay of or the, uh, the, uh, out, the, uh, the design of the factory, where's the machines going to be, how's the material flow going, where are the workers, how can you educate them. This is massive in the production world. So that's production. But the good news is it's unlimited of what you can do with digital twins and eventually also with the metaverse. For example, you can really simulate entire city districts. We all know we really have to do something for the planet. We know that the fight against climate change is going to be won or lost in cities. So we really have to get this going in city districts. We have to rethink of how we plan and build cities. So digital twins are means of really simulating of how entire city districts will behave to become carbon neutral when it comes down to not only where people live and work, but also how their whole energy consumption is going to work with regards to heat pumps, EV charging, everything. You can simulate the entire grid as part of that canvas in that very city. And we're doing this in Berlin as we speak in order to build that next generation of cities. Something that is really cool though, I have to share you, this is my fourth example now. If someone of you is a diver, and if you've seen a coral reef dying, this is definitely heartbreaking. The great news is you also can apply, this is how it looks like, but this is how it should look like. So with digital twins, you have the means actually to simulate also the environment. And so now we can run simulations with regards to how the island or the atoll would work with regards to its coral reefs in terms of the temperature, the currents, how everything would be flowing so that we can then deduct from there how we can save and improve the environment by removing dams, barriers, all of that so that we actually can really make a significant contribution to this planet. This is the power of Digital Twins yet again. Now staying in there, I give you another great example because you may say, wow, this is just for large corporates. It's actually not. It is actually also in particular for those who get started. So let me tell you this story about Nemo's garden. To, um, so so um, uh, Sergio and, uh, and Luca, two Italians, they had this dream of building crops underwater. So you may say, why, why, why crops underwater? It's very simple. The water has a moderating current, so you don't have heat waves. You don't need pesticides. And actually, it is a carbon neutral thing because the ocean serves as a CO2 sink. So really good stuff. There's only one issue. It's a harsh environment because you always have to go underwater. So you have to get this right the first time. This is why Sergio and Luca said, well, why don't we build a digital twin and get this going? Now, the, the good news is they didn't stop there, which is really exciting because once they designed those domes, this is where they grow the lettuce and the basil, they said, we want to have real-time information about, actually, is the crop going well? Illumination, CO2 con uh, uh, concentration, O2 concentration, temperature, all of this. So now we can have the real live digital twin in that regard, which really gets you, if you think about it, the metaverse. And that's my last example that I wanted to show, uh, share with you, batteries. We really want to get into the EV age, right? Because if we get this right, we can really save this planet a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. So for that, speed is of the essence. And you have to build these gigafactories like Fryer, which is a startup that came to us and said, Siemens, can you help us to build the industrial metaverse for a battery manufacturing plant? And this is exactly what you see here. So we did this with a lot of partners, tech partners, in order to get this going where you actually can look at from incoming material, how the material would be flowing, how actually the whole plant would be set up. But the nice thing is it doesn't stop there. We can go now into the machines. We can look at how do you operate these machines and uh, which conditions are they. So pretty much like in Nemo's garden, we can always tell you if this machine is working or not. 
But we don't stop there. We can go to the chemical part of it, and with g -Broms, we can actually simulate all the chemical processes that come into it, and then take it all the way to the end production. And we have a, a booth here. You can take a look at there. There's a lot of good tech that really shows you of how we can build these gigafactories, and some of them will be coming to Canada, will be helping us to speed up, of course, the energy transition. So these are great examples, I hope you would agree, in terms of how we get this metaverse going. So the key question is, will this be an evolution, or is it a revolution? And you can imagine, we think it is definitely an evolution. If you think about it, and if you go 30 years back, how this whole thing got started, this very simple CAD design that was 30, 35 years ago, which was single physics, if you like. This got added then with 3D design and multi-physics, what you saw earlier in the video. Then, actually, it became pervasive. So everybody could work with that in engineering, marketing, production, manufacturing. All of that came together in order to make this work. And then, of course, the digital twin era, which started by and large 2015, hard to say, but where it was really about model-based operations and providing also software as a service or everything as a service, really, in order to get this going. So, good stuff. And we believe 2022 onwards is really the time and the advent now of the metaverse. It's hard to tell again, to nail it down by the day. But the difference being is it's persistent, meaning it's always on. That virtual factory I told you, it's always on. It's always running in the background. It's being fed with new data, new insights, so that you can really derive meaningful actions of how to improve your productivity, how to improve reliability and sustainability as well. So to make this work, you need a lot of technology, as you can imagine. And you see a few of them. So really, um, it's blockchain, 5G, VR, AR, yes. That's fine. We can do that too. But as I said, this is not paramount. But then there's edge computing, highly important, IoT, digital twins, not to mention. And then, of course, nowadays, AI. Let me give you a few words, though, on AI, because the industrial metaverse is really the backdrop to all of this, what's possible. I'll give you three examples. The first one is we talk a lot about generative, but how about we talk about generative design? And what if I tell you that actually this is already happening? Think about a cobot and think about the gripper. And think about, this is what you see here, think about you are not modeling these grippers anymore yourself. All what you tell the model is, I want to have a gripper, it's going to be that durable, it's going to be that large, it's going to weigh so much, and it's going to have these dimensions. And the program actually is designing you the gripper in a way that you would usually not imagine. Look at this. Who would have come up with such a design? Usually we don't, because we are very symmetrically thinking, but this is definitely where it takes us. Why is this great? Because, of course, we can test it. We can test these designs then in the virtual world, in the industrial metaverse, and see if it really works. And the nice thing about this is actually it really reduces the weight and with that also the CO2 uh, quite significantly. That's just one example. Let me tell you, you can do this for many, many other designs as much as you can. Another one, since we talked about EVs, as you know, there's a lot of range anxiety for EVs. And one of the reasons why these electrical vehicles are having sometimes really challenging ranges is heat, temperature, temperature in the cabin. So for that, you need to be able to simulate that. And it turns out there's more than 20,000 different conditions of how to do that. We built a surrogate model, in other words, physics-based AI, which we trained on a subset. And now you can do real-time, real-life simulations of your car of how actually, if the sun sits like that, this is the temperature, how it would come. This is really just happening as we speak with regards to all the modeling that is happening. But maybe my most favorite example is this one. It's the most powerful and it's here to come. It's about, people ask me, why is photorealistic or photorealism so important for the industrial metaverse in, in, the, in the industrial space? And the example is because of synthetic data. You know how long it takes to get in AI, in AI development, how long it takes to get to a good training set? An awful long time. And then qualify all this data. What if you could create that data synthetically from all different shapes, angles, lighting, all of this, and then create that data set, and you can train your model based on the digital 
data that you're creating. You can test it yet again, and that way it really works. This is going to get you, I promise, this is going to get you a significant speed up in terms of development and deployment of AI in the respective factories. So why aren't we here yet? Why aren't we there yet? And there are three reasons. Lack of connectivity. Most of the you know, machines are really not working. Second, the stuff's not working together. And lastly, we need really skilled people. So at Siemens, we said this is bothering us because we really like that thought. We want to see it more and more being applied and really solve real world problems. That's why we launched something that we call the Siemens Accelerator, which is an open digital business platform. And we believe wholeheartedly the future is going to be open, interoperable, flexible, and as a service. The idea of controlling everything is an idea of the past. We have to open up and we have to build ecosystems where you can take small and large companies along the ride. So the large integrators, the large infrastructure providers, but many, many startups that actually can build their applications on top of it. And the fact that we are open and that we provide open APIs gives you the ability to build your own applications on top of that. That's the reason why also we are here this year at Collision. With that, let me close that. Is it a hype or a hope? Well, you have imagined while well, we think about it. It's for sure not the fancy virtual world. It is really here about solving real world problems at the light and the speed of digital. And with that, a big thank you to all of you.